สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're in our retreat series, which is titled Harmony and Relationships. We're going to be learning all about this first fetter, titled Personal Existence View. This is what you need to eliminate in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment, along with two other fetters as well. So I'd like to welcome all of you to this class because we're going to really be diving deep into understanding personal existence view and how to actually solve this through the universal truth of non-self. I've talked about this in other classes, but here is an opportunity for us to really dive deeply into it because students will typically need a lot of discussion around this to deeply understand it. For a student who's studying about personal existence view and how to get the self out of the way, there's already been study of the three universal truths, the the four noble truths, the eightfold path. The five precepts. They're starting to put together their meditation practice. They're already developing their practice to a certain extent. And in this particular retreat that I taught in the USA this summer, I already taught all of those things and others before we actually got to this topic. But here, in order to have real harmony in your relationships, you're going to need to eliminate personal existence view to help you get. Closer and closer to the enlightened mental state. So I'm going to spend a good amount of time here just talking about what personal existence view is and the challenges that you face because of it. And then we're going to focus the other part of our class on how to actually eliminate this through certain practices. As we go in today's class, you're able to ask questions if you like. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section, and one of our moderators will be pleased to help you and be able to ensure that your question gets asked during the class. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So let's talk about personal existence view, and let's talk about the fetters in general. Because our next class next Sunday, we're going to be going through all the ten fetters. What a fetter is is it's a like a ball in a chain, like a shackle around your ankle that's keeping you trapped in the unenlightened state. As long as you have these fetters in the mind, then you're not going to be able to experience enlightenment. So along with putting together all the steps of the Eightfold Path and moving the mind closer and closer to enlightenment. Through improving the way that the mind functions through the Eightfold Path, you're going to need to eventually start focusing on these ten fetters and eliminating each and every one of them from the mind. And in order to do that, you need to deeply understand what each individual fetter is and what the solution is to how to eradicate it. You wouldn't be able to just jump in and eradicate personal existence view right from the beginning because you haven't done the preliminary work of understanding things like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts. You don't have a well-developed meditation practice yet, so all of those things and some others are going to need to be put together so that you can then actually actively. Uh, eliminate the personal existence view from the mind. So this is just one of many fetters or taints or pollutions of mind. These are also called defilements. This is what's hindering the mind from experiencing this brightness or this radiance of the enlightened mind. Because once the mind is enlightened, it'll be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, never being shaken up ever again. It'll be stable and steady. It'll have focus. It'll have concentration. It'll have clarity of mind, and it'll have deep memory. But as long as this fetter and this pollution and others are in the mind, it's not going to be able to experience that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. It's going to be shaken up. And what personal existence view is is where the unenlightened mind falsely believes or mistakenly understands and has this misperception that this physical body and/or this mind is you. But the Buddha says there is no you there. And what the unenlightened mind is doing is it has a certain self-image that it might be trying to project through certain clothing or certain appearance, certain aspects of beautifying the physical body that it thinks that this is who you are as a person. Or there's certain identity in the mind, certain things that the mind thinks that I am American or I am Canadian or I am Egyptian or 
I am a professor, or I am a Buddhist teacher, or I am a parent, or all of these other I am's. And as long as this is in the mind, it's going to be shaken up. So what you're looking at is trying to understand through the teachings of the Buddha what this personal existence view is and what the solution is to it. So this personal existence view is where the mind is craving, it's longing, it's yearning, it has this desire for agreeable contact about your self-image. So if you hear somebody say, wow, you're wearing all white, that is so handsome. I really like how you wear all white. That just looks so great on you. This is agreeable contact for someone who has personal existence view in the mind. They might get these pleasant feelings that is conditioned on somebody saying something pleasing about the self-image. But the problem is, is that now when you hear something disagreeable, where somebody says, why would you ever wear white? That is so stupid to wear white clothing all the time. Don't you know you're gonna get dirty when you're working on your motorbike or you're you know, walking on the street, there's gonna be dust and dirt. You know, you're, you're so stupid for wearing all white clothing. Well, if you allowed the mind to get the happy feelings when somebody said something agreeable, then when the mind hears this disagreeable contact, then you're going to experience painful feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, and others. And the mind can't reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because it has this craving, it's holding on, it's clinging to this personal existence view, wanting to project a certain self-image in the world. And when it hears agreeable things, it'll experience pleasant feelings. And when the mind hears disagreeable things, it'll experience painful feelings. So as long as that's in there, then the mind's going to be shaken up like this. And another example about around this self-image is say you were out somewhere and you were wearing all white like this or even any other color too. And say you got some chocolate ice cream on your clothing. You might feel embarrassed, right? You might feel shy or embarrassed uh, that you've got this chocolate ice cream on you. The reason why that's arising in the mind is because of personal existence view. The mind is trying to project itself in the world and look a certain way to other people. And now when you've got this smear of chocolate ice cream across your clothes, now you might feel embarrassed at this party or something like this. And this is where the mind's experiencing the shaking up right? You were experiencing those pleasant feelings, thinking you look so great in whatever clothing you were wearing, whatever you were projecting a certain image, maybe your hair was done a certain way, maybe you had certain jewelry or makeup or something like this on. And then when you went out into the world, you felt so great. But now when you've got this chocolate ice cream, you feel embarrassed, you feel shy, you feel less of a person because now your image has changed. It's no longer looking the way that you did before. And now the same thing with the self-identity, that if you have a certain self-identity in the mind that you're holding on to, when you hear certain agreeable contact, you're going to get pleasant feelings. But when you hear disagreeable contact, you're going to get painful feelings. So if I am an American, and that's the way that the mind thinks, when you hear somebody say, all Americans are wonderful, they're so great, they're so loving, they're so kind, then you might experience pleasant feelings. But then when you hear disparaging comments that are negative and diminishing and degrading about Americans, if I am an American and that's the way that my mind thinks, then when you hear this degrading, diminishing speech about Americans, you're going to associate that with who you are as a person. And now your mind is going to be angry or sad or frustrated or irritated or annoyed. And it's not just that I am an American. That's not the only thing that the mind holds on to, but it holds on to other aspects of our identity that somebody might think that this is who you are as a person. Whereas if you have a certain occupation, if you're a police officer or a lawyer or a doctor, or a food server or a taxi driver or something like this. You might be doing that job for a period of time and you might start associating this as part of your identity and who you are as a person. But then when that changes due to maybe an injury or you got laid off of your job or something else, 
maybe you retire even you might feel like you're lost you might feel like you know you're just kind of lost and you don't know who you are anymore because you've associated with who you are as being a police officer or a lawyer or a doctor or a food server or a taxi driver or some other occupation and you thought that this is who you are as a person so now when you're not doing that anymore then the mind feels lost and confused like you don't even know who you are anymore this can even happen if you were a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you assumed that role or maybe a husband or a wife and you assumed that role and you felt like that's who you are as a person, that I am a boyfriend or I am a girlfriend or I am a wife or I am a husband. And now when that relationship ends because of impermanence, now there's this craving, this longing. So there's this boredom and this loneliness and this sadness that sets in. And the unenlightened mind thinks that the way to solve that is to hurry up and get back into another relationship. And if I can just get back into another relationship and grab onto this other person, and now I can reassume that role as a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband or wife, then everything will be fine. But it's actually not because the real true problem is this personal existence view where the mind is thinking that this self-identity of being a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband or wife, that this is permanent and the mind is clinging to this and it thinks that it can't be peaceful. It can't be joyful when you're single, for example. So now the mind might hurry up and hurry up and hurry up and try to find another partner and you might make an unwise decision about who to be with just because you're trying to hurry up and reassume that role where you think the mind will be content and satisfied in that situation. And then you grab on to this person. And now for one reason or another, things start going badly. And now the relationship's over again. And now you're right back into the same problem where the mind craves and longs to be a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife. And now it's wanting that next relationship again. So if you can understand that this isn't who you are, that you're performing a certain role, that you are in a relationship, but that doesn't define you. That's not who you are. The same thing can happen with parents. If you've been a parent and you've had children and maybe they've lived with you for an extended period of time as they were growing up, 18, 20, 22, what have you. And now you get to a point where maybe they've chosen to move out of the house and you might feel lost and you don't really know your place in the world anymore because at one time you felt like you were a parent and you were giving all this guidance and maybe you were taking your child to sporting events or activities or doing certain things with them and now you're not doing those things anymore and you might feel lost and kind of empty inside because now you're no longer parenting them in the same way that you did. Things have changed, but the mind is clinging and holding on to this personal existence view of I am a mom or I am a dad and this is who I am as a person. You can even get to the point where an individual says, you know, I don't even know who I am anymore. I need to go on this journey to find myself because I feel like I've lost myself. I don't even know who I am anymore. And people might go on this journey. You know, people do that here in Thailand. They will come from different countries and they're on this journey to find themselves. Well, what they end up doing is they start finding other activities or they find other hobbies or they may find another occupation that they're now feeling passionately about or that they're craving and holding on to. But all they've done is assumed new a self image or a new self identity that the mind is now clinging to that and feeling like that's who they are. And now five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, all of that crumbles. And now they don't know who they are anymore. They don't know who they are. They are looking for this self. Well, there is no self. The Buddha explains this in his teachings that there is no you there. As long as the mind is clinging to this personal existence view and thinking that there is a self and looking for it and craving for it and wanting to find out where it is and cling to it, then there's going to be this continued discontentedness. So the Buddha offers this solution of the universal truth of non-self. And this universal truth of non-self helps you to understand that there is no self, that there isn't a self there, that there is a physical body and there is a mind that has come together for this existence, but this doesn't determine who you are as a person. Now, remember everything with the Buddhist teachings 
you don't believe them. You learn, you reflect, and you practice. So learning that personal existence view is a problem. And some of the things that I've said in others, there's other problems that the personal existence view uh, creates. You should start hearing some experiences that you've had in your life where personal existence view has caused problems. That some of these examples that I've given, and we can talk about others if you'd like, are helping you to learn what personal existence view is and why it's such a problem. And you can start reflecting on this and start understanding to reflect on it, right? And then I'm going to talk to you later about how to eliminate it through practice. But now let's learn something else. Let's learn about the solution to this, which is the universal truth of non-self. This is where you train the mind that there is no self, but you need to first learn about it first. So learning about it is to understand that there is no self that this physical body and this mind is not you. This is a body and a mind that has come together for this existence, but this isn't who you are as a person. Okay, so that's learning about the universal truth of non-self. Now let's start reflecting on it and see if it's actually true. See if there is a permanent self, because the Buddha is saying that there is no self. But now you can start reflecting on this. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how you can reflect on this and independently verify the truth for yourself. Think about how you viewed yourself when you were a child, when you were a teenager, in early adulthood, and then now. The characteristics or personality or how you viewed yourself has been constantly changing, has it not? You viewed yourself in one way when you were a child, and then as you aged as a teenager, you kind of took on a different kind of self-image, different self-identity, certain characteristics, certain personality, and you viewed yourself in a certain way. And then as you moved into early adulthood, that changed some more. And now at this point in life, if you look back over your life, what you've seen is the self-image and the self-identity has been constantly changing. That's because there is no permanent self. There is no self. But of course, the unenlightened mind thinks that there is. So this is one way to reflect on it and see that there is no permanent self, that this universal truth of non-self is true. Another way to do this is that you can take your finger and you can point and you can say, you know, where is Chrissy? Where is Tonka? Where is Bunya? Where is Bassam? Where is Rebecca? Where is Amina? Where is, uh, you know, John? Where is uh, anybody? Whoever this name is that you have, you know, point. Where are you? Well, typically people will either point to the chest or point to the head. And when this pointing is happening, look at what you're pointing at. Look at what you're truly pointing at. If I pointed to the chest, what I'm pointing at is a shirt. I'm not pointing at David. I'm pointing at a shirt. And if I point to the mind, I'm just pointing to skin. You know, I'm just pointing to this head, this skin on the side of the skull. That skin or this shirt is David. So if we got rid of the shirt and I pointed to the chest again and someone asking me, where is David? And I pointed to the chest again, then that's skin. There's just skin there. So I take that skin off. And then where's David? You point again. Well, that's just bones. Okay, now we've got the ribs. So wh we get rid of the ribs. Where is David? So somebody points and I point. I say, this is David. Well, now we've just got muscle tissue. We've got organs. We've got fluid. That's not David. There is no David there in this physical body. This is just little increments of bits and pieces of parts and fluid and muscle and tissues. This isn't actually David. This is just a physical body. And the same thing with the mind. It's just the mind. It's not David. It's not who I am. What we truly have here is we have this big bag of skin with bones and fluid and muscle tissue and uh, essentially what happens at birth is we get this name, David, and this is where some of the problem comes in, is that we get this name, David, and now we start associating that name, David, to who we are. And now we start having this self-image or self-identity that starts getting wrapped into this name, David. And now we start uh, owning this name, David, and thinking that this is who we are as a person. 
But this name David is just a label that was given at birth to make it easy for people to know who they're talking about. Because when I came home from school and grandma called to mom and said, uh, hey, did that big bag of skin and fluid and bones come home from school? Right? They're not going to say that. That's not the way that people communicate. Instead, grandma needed to say, did David come home from school yet? And then my mom could say, yes, David's doing his homework. And they would understand who they were talking about. But this name that we get at birth, we have this name and it starts becoming part of this self-image and self-identity. And now the mind gets all wrapped around this personal existence view, thinking that this is who we are as a person. And now we start projecting this self-image and self-identity in the world. We cling to it. When we hear certain agreeable things, then we get these pleasant feelings. And when we hear these disagreeable things, we get these painful feelings. Or if we're in those situations like boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, mommy, daddy, and now we're no longer performing that role anymore, now our mind craves to be back in that role because that's who we think we are. We feel lost. Uh, when we're not doing those things because we think that that's who we are as a person. Or if we get some chocolate ice cream smeared on our clothes or some spaghetti sauce, you might feel embarrassed, right? These situations and others are going to occur when there's personal existence view in the mind. And when you hear things on the news that are disparaging, you know, certain things that you're into or certain things that you identify with or somebody's talking great about those things, right? If somebody says all Buddhist teachers are so amazing, they're so friendly, they're so generous, they're so kind, they give all their time to help people to progress on this path. Well, if I think I am a Buddhist teacher, then when I hear those things, now the mind's going to experience pleasant feelings. But then when I hear somebody say, all Buddhist teachers are leading people to hell. You know, how dare they? They're destroying humanity. Now you're going to experience sadness or anger or frustration. But if you let go of that, and I don't identify as I am a Buddhist teacher, I, ch I don't think that way. I choose to share the teachings of the Buddha to help people. And that's a certain role that I fulfill. But that's not who I am as a person. So you can look at this universal truth of non-self through reflection, looking at how you are not this body and you're not this mind because your personality and characteristics have been changing over time. You can't point to one specific thing that is David. And you can also look at it this way, that if your arm was amputated for any certain reason, are you less of a person because of that? Well, the answer is no. You have less use of an arm. You now only have one arm and one hand to use, but you're not less of a person. If this body was who you are as a person, when your arm or your leg or something else got amputated, you would feel like less of a person. But you're not less of a person. You just have less physical structures available to you to be able to do certain things in the world. But you're not less of a person. So here you can reflect and you can see that this physical body isn't you and this mind isn't you. And then when you understand personal existence view, this pollution, this taint, this fetter, and you understand that there is no permanent self, that the universal truth of non-self is the truth, then what our discussion becomes is how do we implement this into practice so that we can eradicate this personal existence view? What are the things that we can be doing on a daily basis in order to eradicate this personal existence view? And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our class time discussing. But what I would like to do is open up to any questions that you guys might have to help Make sure that you understand what personal existence view is and the challenges and the difficulties that you have and have had around having personal existence view in the mind. And then any questions that you have around the universal truth of non-self and making sure that you understand that before we start talking about the practice part. So you can ask questions by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions uh, that you'd like. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, Bruce has a question on Facebook. He asks, as I try to comprehend non-self, 
I can understand that there is no one thing that we can call the self, but I get myself confused when I try to determine what is the thing that is learning these teachings or reading and comprehending words in a book and so on. Is it just the mind? Thank you. Yes, that's right. It's Bruce, right, Chrissy? Yes. Yeah. Bruce, you're 100% correct there. That all that is, is it's the mind. It's the consciousness. And it's connected to this body for now. So we use the eyes of the body in order to bring in content into the mind. And we use the ears to bring in things into the body, into the mind. We use the nose. We use the tongue. We have physical contact with the body. And then there's the mind. These are called the six sense bases. And as long as you have this mind and body together, there's going to be a certain amount of of uh, content that's coming in through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the physical body, and the mind. And this is what's learning, is the mind is learning, right? So there's this body, there's this mind, and then the combination of these th two things together is what we refer to as the person. But neither of these two things are who you are as a person. It's just that we use the word person to make it easy for us to refer to this physical body that looks like this in this mind that comes together. We say that's a human being or that's a person. So we can label this and know what it is. But at the same time, we can also train the mind that this isn't who you are as a person. So it's the mind that's learning. It's the mind that's comprehending the teachings. It's the mind that's aware of what I'm saying right now. But that mind is using the physical body, like the ears, to listen and bring that into the mind. And it's the eyes that are looking at this video and able to bring in what's happening in the video. But it's the mind that is experiencing all these things. But that's not who you are. It's just consciousness. It's just awareness. Okay, thank you, sir. And then Miranda also asks on Facebook, since the body is not the self, does this mean we should not care about the body? Or is there a middle way with caring for the body also? Yes, you would like to have the middle way. So even though we know that this body isn't who we are, it's still here, it's still a component of this person. And a wise decision that the mind makes is to take care of this physical body. So we have good hygiene, you know, we brush our teeth, we uh, bathe, we clean our ears, we clean other parts of the body, we go get medical checkups, we do these different things because it's a wise decision to take care of this physical body because the mind is going to experience whatever is going on with this physical body. So if we allow the health of the body to degrade, then that's going to put stress and a burden on the mind. It will degrade over time because of aging, but we would like to try to attend to the physical body as best we can to maintain its health as best we can. But we understand that the physical health of this body is impermanent. There are going to be periods of time where the body is unhealthy. And then we just make wise decisions to get back to health and restore health. And when there is health, we make wise decisions around caring for it. This is the middle way. Whereas if we were craving health and we wanted it and we were craving cleanliness and we were craving extreme health, then the mind's going to be discontent when it's not experiencing that. But also if we were indifferent and we didn't care less about the body and we didn't take care of it, we didn't do things to actually ensure that it was healthy, then that's not going to be the middle way either. So we find this middle way where the mind's not craving for permanent health and going to the extremes in order to create health. And then also the mind's not going to the other extreme, which is indifference and not caring. Instead, we come into the middle where now we practice this middle way where we make wise, decision, wise decisions towards maintaining our health and improving our health, all the while knowing that there is going to be a degrading of health over time as this physical body ages. But as this physical body ages, 
we know that that's not me. That's not who I am. Whereas if you think this physical body is you, when you're young and youthful, you might look a certain way. But then when you look in the mirror and you see your first wrinkle, oh my goodness, I'm getting old. Or you see this gray hair starting to come in. Oh my goodness, gray hair, right? This is where the mind gets discontent because it's starting to think that this is who you are as a person. Whereas if you understand impermanence that there's going to be wrinkles, there's going to be gray hairs, you're not going to have the youthful appearance you once did, and this is all completely normal. Whereas if you were craving permanence, you might go to extremes in order to maintain a youthful appearance. And now this is where the mind gets discontent. So you can have this middle way where you might choose to do certain things in order to maintain uh, the body looking a certain way, but you don't identify with that's who you are. So if you see a bunch of gray hairs coming in, you might choose to dye your hair. But whether you do that today or you do it two or three weeks from now and it gets grayer and grayer, your mind can be perfectly content either way. So it's not about whether we choose to do these things, which you're going to hear me talk about when we talk about the practice. It's about what's the condition of the mind and we can forge this middle way and we can do things to maintain the body, but we can do that with peacefulness and joy and not being shaken up when we see the wrinkle or we see uh, gray hair or we get the flu or we get COVID or we get some other illness. We can just make wise decisions in order to solve it because what some of us have been taught in the past is that when we see certain problematic things like this, that there should be a higher power that we should pray to. And this being is going to somehow solve our medical issues, but that's not how it works. Instead, the way that our medical issues get resolved is we make wise decisions that we go see a doctor that we consult with the, maybe one or two or three doctors if we need to. And then we listen to their advice. We kind of reflect on that. We decide if this is a wise course of action, whatever medical procedures or certain medicines that they recommend. And then we use those in order to restore health. And then when there is health, we do things like exercising. Perhaps some people might choose to do that or eat healthy or have a certain active lifestyle. We do that from the middle way in order to maintain the health, all the while knowing that the body is impermanent and it's going to gradually decline and degrade over time because of impermanence. Thank you, sir. Our Tonka has her hand raised. Let's go to her. Thank you, Christy. We have a question on YouTube. Born in Washington is asking a question related to the role of parenting. Dear teacher, I don't have good relationship with my son. How can I review, continue building and deepen the relationship based on Buddha's teaching? There's a lot of teachings that I can help you with here, but this particular class wouldn't be the best time to talk about that. I would like to invite you to schedule a personal guidance session with me where you can go to our website, buddhadailywisdom.com, and there's links on there. If you click on teacher, you can see where you can schedule a personal guidance and we can talk one-on-one -on -one because there's certain things that I will need to help you to get started with because there's many different aspects of this and there's certain videos and certain parts in the books that I've written that, that talk about this. But if we talk personally, then I can guide you to those resources and you'll be able to then investigate those resources and I can have continued talks with you. And that'll be the best way for you to get the answers to the questions that you're asking for. Thank you, Teacher David. Also, Brandon is asking, there is a problem in the United States with suicide. Is it correct to say that a big part of this epidemic is the wrong view based around personal existence view? Part of it can be. People usually are looking to do harm for one reason or another. It's because the mind is discontent, there's craving, desire, attachment in there. It could be that maybe someone's being bullied or the, you know someone's being degrading or something like this, or maybe they lost their job or they lost money and they associate with being a certain lifestyle, a certain wealth. And now when they don't have that anymore, they feel like they're empty and they're lost and they might commit suicide because of that. But there's other reasons why people might have su commit suicide as well. And 
die by suicide. It can be the personal existence view, but it's not the only reason. It can be other things as well. And also we have the middle way uh, is asking how to do it in the middle way, probably related to the question before about the body. Yes, I'm, I'm just assuming. Yes, I'm going to teach you the practice part of how to eliminate personal existence view when we move beyond where we are right now in the class. Right now, I would just like to be sure you guys are clear on the problem and that you've done a bit of reflection to understand the problem of personal existence view, of what it is and what it causes and what you're going to see happening in the mind when there's personal existence view there. These pleasant feelings and painful feelings that are going to arise based on personal existence view. And I would like to be sure you understand a bit about the universal truth of non-self, having learned and reflected on it and started to see that there is no permanent self before we start talking about the practice part. Thank you, teacher David. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And Bassam also has his hand raised, sir. Thanks, Chrissy. Well, teacher, so if I am a citizen of a certain country and I'm supporting the team of this country, let's say that I am from Brazil and now I'm supporting the uh, football soccer Brazilian team. And now this team didn't win in the match. And the mind experiences the contentedness. Is it resulting from this uh, self-identity? It depends. It could potentially be. If there's a craving to win, this is just a craving to win, right? This mental longing and strong eagerness to win uh, in the mind can be discontent, you know, sad or angry or frustrated. Or even when you do win, it can have all these pleasant feelings, all this excitedness because of the win. And that's what the person's looking for. But connected to that could be this national pride that we talk about, right? This is really created within countries where uh, people might be looking to promote this national pride and identifying with, you know, I am American or I am Brazilian or I am Canadian or I am Thai or I am Australian or I am Japanese. You know, a, a country is very much interested in their citizens being deeply invested in their country and taking on this identity of this is who I am and having this national pride. So there can surely be that connected to a win in the World Cup, for example, Basim, but it may not be, it really depends. But oftentimes it is at times like this, when there's Olympics and there's the World Cup and things like this, that there's a certain amount of national pride because we call it national pride because it sounds like a good thing, but in reality, what's actually happening is there's this uh, personal existence view where now I am American or I am Brazilian. So when Brazil wins, now I feel emboldened because that's who I am. But now when Brazil loses, now we're angry, we're frustrated, we go out in the streets and we riot and we break things up. Or sometimes even when people win in these big competitions, they go out and riot and break things up because they're so excited that this strong emotion, these strong feelings have to be vented somewhere, and they oftentimes come out in destructive ways. So this is part of the problem, but in that situation that you're describing, Basim, it may not necessarily be the only problem. It might just be a craving to win, because you can have somebody who's maybe an American who's uh, longing for Brazil to win, maybe that's their team, they've selected that as their team, and now when Brazil wins, they don't necessarily identify with being Brazilian, but because Brazil won, now they get these pleasant feelings, or because Brazil lost, they've got the painful feeling. So it, it can be with personal existence view, but not always. Yes, now it's clear. Thanks, Sajan. You're welcome. Looks like Tonka has her hand raised, sir. Teacher David, uh, Tom is writing here. I'm not sure if this is appropriate time, so I'm going to let you decide on that. I'll just read this quickly. In my experience, it's not possible to avoid ego world. 
I'm doing meditation to clear my mind, to get back to awareness. How can I protect my mind and not to be infected by toxic people? Thank you, Tom. Okay, so right now you're not seeing how you can necessarily eliminate the ego and dissolve the ego because the ego is still there and you haven't gained the wisdom yet of how to eliminate the ego. Impersonal existence view is part of the ego. When we describe the word ego, this is a modern word that we use today. Uh, but what we're describing is we're describing this personal existence view, which is the first fetter, and it's the eighth fetter of conceit. These together are what we're referring to as the ego. And both of these need to actually be eliminated and dissolved from the mind in order to get to enlightenment. As long as there's personal existence view and or conceit in the mind, you won't experience enlightenment. So both of these need to be eliminated in order to get to the point where the mind is enlightened. And there's certain wisdom that you need in order to be able to experience that. You're not going to be able to see it easily. Uh, you're going to need to read volume one, chapter 16. That's where I go into a lot of detail. And you can download that book for free by going to buddhadailywisdom.com. You can download it for free. You can take it and go print it, or you can order it on Amazon if you'd like. And there you'll learn about the ego and how it needs to be dissolved. It's something that you wouldn't necessarily know how to do until you're actually learning about it and actually doing it, and then seeing how the mind can live without this arrogance, without the pride, without the judging others, without the measuring and comparing each other. That's what needs to actually occur in order for the mind to experience the enlightened mental state. So same thing, if you would like to read the chapter 16 in volume one, and if you have questions, you can post those into the Facebook group. Uh, you can also schedule a personal guidance session. Anybody can schedule personal guidance. As we go here and we talk, you might have more questions around the ego because there are certain things with personal existence view that is part of the ego, right? If you have a certain job, like I am a doctor, or I'm a lawyer, or I'm a taxi driver, or you know, I'm anything, there's a certain e amount of arrogance or pride sometimes, measuring and comparing you know, one to another that makes the mind think that it's emboldened. And then when you lose that job, then the mind can feel lost because you feel like that's part of you. So personal existence view is part of this ego, but it's not the entire ego. The Buddha described it as personal existence view and conceit. We've recently created this word ego, but it actually helps to look at it the way that the Buddha did in two separate parts, because the way that you're gonna approach it and the way that you're gonna eliminate it and the way that you're gonna address it is going to be similar in some situations, but also it's gonna be very unique and different in other situations. So I'm gonna explain it to you today, how to eliminate this personal existence view so that the mind can ultimately reside more peaceful and joyful. Thank you, teacher David. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That looks like all the questions we have right now, sir. Okay, so now I'm going to move into what I actually have to share with you guys related to the actual elimination of personal existence view and talking about how to practice in such a way that you can eliminate this. So. As you guys are understanding, personal existence view is the way that the mind falsely and mistakenly believes that the physical body and or the mind is the self, that this is who you are as a person. This is just a misperception that the self-image or self-identity is who you are as a person. But neither of these things are who you are. There is a body, there is a mind, and they're together now, and we need to take care of those. That's why we take showers and brush our teeth. That's why we meditate to take care of the mind and take care of the body. But these things aren't who we are. But practicing the middle way, we need to make sure we take care of them. But now what you need to do in order to train the mind to eliminate personal existence view is you need to eliminate this false belief 
or this misperception, this misunderstanding that this physical body or this mind is who you are as a person. So essentially you need to rewire the mind. You need to purify the mind of this pollution. You need to clean it out so that the mind no longer falsely believes or mistakenly understands or has this misperception that this is who you are as a person. Because as long as personal existence view is in the mind, now when somebody says something agreeable or disagreeable, the mind's going to keep getting shaken up. Or when you identify with a certain personal existence view, when you're not in that role, for example, you're going to long and yearn to be in that role. Or if you get that smudge of chocolate ice cream across your shirt, you're going to feel embarrassed. And this is discontentedness arising because of personal existence view. So what you would like to do in order to eradicate this is first, you need to deeply learn and practice the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is the underlying foundation that everything else is built on. Everything else plugs into the Eightfold Path in one way or another. So you would need to deeply understand it through the words of the Buddha. If you study the Eightfold Path in other texts or other classes or with other teachers, okay, that's great. That's what's led you to where you are now. But through the resources that I share, using the words of the Buddha, you can understand exactly what he taught related to the Eightfold Path, using his words. So there's books that I've written that have this. Volume 1, Chapter 4 and 5 will help you understand this. There's many videos and classes that I've made, podcasts and things like this. There's even a group learning program that's going to be starting on January 8th, which every Sunday I'm going to be walking you through and helping you to understand all the foundational teachings to get to enlightenment. And among the first classes, we're going to take a really deep dive into the Eightfold Path. There's three individual classes where we're going to break the Eightfold Path down into its individual components. And I'm going to be using the words of the Buddha to deeply explain the Eightfold Path, helping you learn it, helping you reflect on it, and then helping you learn how to practice it so that you can move it into practice because that's the foundation. You're going to need that in order to understand how to implement all these other things. So the Eightfold Path is really needed in order for you to be able to then prepare the mind through practicing the Eightfold Path, which includes meditation, to essentially kind of soften up the mind a bit and start seeing some of the true reality of the natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught. Then as you're doing that, you should start noticing some improvements. I've heard some people as short as two days, they've been studying the words of the Buddha and practicing in the way that I teach with the words of the Buddha, that even in two days, they've come to retreats and they said, you know, I just got an email that would have thrown me off and I would have gotten so angry and hostile, but I understood it and I was completely calm when I got this email this morning and they attributed it to the last two days of them studying in the retreat. And then other people, you know, it might take you a few weeks or a few months to kind of put things together and start noticing some benefits. It really depends on how you absorb information, how dedicated and diligent you are to learning and practicing and implementing the teachings. But as you're learning this path through the words of the Buddha, you'll start seeing the improvement to the condition of the mind. Eventually, you get to experiencing the four jhanas, which are the preliminary phases that the mind goes through before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment. There's four individual stages of enlightenment, and you're experiencing discontentedness all the way until you get to the last stage, which is Arahant. This is where the mind is actually enlightened. There's going to be diminishing of discontentedness. This anger and sadness and frustration and guilt and shame and fear and boredom and loneliness, the grief and misery, all of that is going to be gradually diminishing as you gradually train the mind. And as you get into that first stage of enlightenment, there'll be a significant diminishing of discontentedness, but it doesn't get fully eliminated until the mind is fully and firmly in that fourth stage as an otter hunt. But as you're starting to experience these jhanas, these preliminary phases that the mind goes through before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment, you'll be getting these glimpses of what enlightenment is like. 
you may actually be getting some of those now. If you're in meditation and for like three seconds or even one second, you're experiencing a bit of peacefulness and joy, and it's just like, oh, wow, that feels so nice. Right there, you're getting a little bit of a glimpse of what enlightenment is like, even if it's just one second. Or during your life, you might get a few minutes or a few hours or maybe a few days even where you're experiencing this peacefulness and joy. Like there's nothing that you need that you just feel fully satisfied, fully fulfilled, completely joyful, completely peaceful, and you don't need anything else right now. But then some discontentedness comes in at some point. That's because the mind is still unenlightened. So you're going to be getting these glimpses of what enlightenment is like, this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy as the mind's working its way on this path. And when you're starting to experience that, and you've observed that you're putting together the Eightfold Path, and you now understand this backwards and forwards, left, right, up, down, like the back of your hand, and you're really putting the Eightfold Path together, and you feel like you got your arms around that pretty well, you're seeing a regular, consistent meditation practice that has been developed, now it might be time to start focusing on the fetters. And this personal existence view is a good one to focus on because it's one that the mind tends to have the most challenge to understand and one of the ones that's more challenging to actually implement. But it is the first fetter, and it requires the mind to get the first three fetters to be eliminated in order to get to that first stage of enlightenment. The first fetter is personal existence view, the second one is doubt, and then the third one is wrong behavior and observances, which we're going to talk about all of these and others in our next class next Sunday. But as you're starting to get those glimpses of the jhanas and you're starting to get this glimpses of what enlightenment is like, that's where you'd really like to hone in on understanding what personal existence view is and what this universal truth of non-self is. And it may be the right time to start implementing this meditation to realize non-self. I have it in volume one, chapter 11. It's described there how to do it. You may need personal guidance in order to talk to me about uh, getting some help on how to do that. But if you're familiar with loving kindness meditation and the way that I teach that in all the classes, the meditation to realize non-self is very similar, but with different affirmations. And now using those affirmations along with all the other stuff that you're already doing, you're already practicing the Eightfold Path, things like right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. You've already got a regular breathing mindfulness meditation practice and loving kindness meditation practice in progress. You're already doing these things. So now you might decide to add in this meditation to realize non-self. And you might need to do this for a while until the mind starts to let go of this self where it falsely believes and mistakenly understands having this misperception that there is a self. Right? So you gradually implement this meditation as just one aspect of what it's going to take in order to eliminate personal existence view. There's multiple things that you might choose to do. It's not just one of these things that's going to eliminate the personal existence view. And if you're just starting to learn with me, you wouldn't be able to just jump right in and do this meditation to realize on self and then the self is going to be completely eradicated. That's not how it works. You need to do this preliminary work first and then when the mind's ready and it's prepared with this baseline foundation of the Eightfold Path, then it might be the right time to bring in the meditation to realize non-self. The next thing is that you're going to need to look at the language that you're using because the way that we speak is the way that the mind thinks. So if you're speaking harsh and aggressive, for example, that's because there's a certain amount of craving and anger in the mind, a certain amount of ignorance and unknowing of true reality. So the you're going to speak in however the mind thinks. So if you continue to say, I have a headache, or I am hungry, or I am thirsty, or I am tired, if you think that way and you speak that way, then the mind is associating with this physical body as being who you are as a person. So if I have a headache, that means there's still an I there. 
there is no I, there is no you, there's no you there. So as long as the language that you use is still I have a headache or I am hungry or I am thirsty, then that I is going to stick around and the mind still thinks that way. So what you would like to do is purge this from the way that you talk and the way that you think. Start to disassociate with this I that keeps coming up in your language. See, the problem is, is that the English language isn't really well suited for true reality. We use this word I a lot, and it's not really well suited in order to describe what we're truly experiencing in this life. So what you might decide to do is kind of change the way that you're speaking and thus change the way that you're thinking. Instead of, I have a headache, you might think the head hurts or the body needs food. Instead of, I am hungry, the body needs food, right? Instead of, I am thirsty, the body needs water. This is a way to disassociate with this I and continuing to think that I have a headache, I am hungry, or I am thirsty. Start changing the language, and this will change the way that the mind thinks. The same thing, instead of I am going to my work, right, because this is I, my work, putting these words in there, I'm going to, you know, you might say that you know, sometimes you might use this word I in, in relationship to I am going to work, but at the same time, the mind deeply understands that this isn't mine, it doesn't belong to me, or I am going home. You might use that word occasionally in your language because the English language is ill-equipped to really explain true reality. So in 90%, 95% of the time, you might be able to say things like the body hurts or the head hurts or the body needs food or, you know, uh, this is the job that I am currently working on. But if you need to put that word I in there for any reason, you need to ensure that the mind is disassociating with it, that it's not truly seeing it as I am going to my work. Same thing with my son, right? I might say, this is my son when I introduce him to somebody. But the mind deeply understands he's not mine. He doesn't belong to me. So that way that the mind is not grabbing and clinging and controlling this being. Instead, it would be really awkward if I said, you know, this is the being that I contributed sperm to uh, about 11 years ago right? This would be quite odd if I spoke this way in public forum or around anybody, even my wife, if I said that, she'd probably look at me funny, right? So we end up saying, this is my son, you know, and be able to introduce to somebody. But the mind needs to deeply understand that this isn't mine. So when I say, you know, if I'm driving somewhere, if you have a certain car, your mind might now might think this is my car, and the mind might have a certain personal existence, a certain self-image or self-identity that it's associating with this car. So instead of saying my car, you might just say this is the car, or I need to take the car to work, or I need to take the car to get an oil change, instead of I need to take my car to get an oil change. So when you start changing the language in various life situations, in connected with your relationships, certain objects, and certain life situations. Now, by modifying your language and adjusting the language, you're going to modify the way that the mind thinks about these things. And you might need to do this for a period of six months or a year or so to gradually train the mind to eliminate this personal existence view. And once you do, you might choose to go back and just say, yeah, I'm going to my work. It might be easier in certain situations to just say that. But by that point, the mind will deeply have been trained in order to understand that this isn't mine. It doesn't belong to me, right? And the way that you'll know that personal existence view has been eliminated is that when you hear something agreeable or disagreeable about the self-image or self-identity, there'll be no discontentedness whatsoever. So if somebody attacks you on Facebook or social media, you won't feel like they're attacking you. 
right? But as long as there's a you here and you feel that there is a you, when somebody says something disparaging on a post or on a comment, you're going to feel offended. But when you start seeing that through doing this work that I'm going to describe to you today, then gradually, slowly, but surely, as this personal existence view wears away, you won't take things personally like that. You won't feel embarrassment in situations. If the mind is embarrassed, that's a perfect example of discontentedness that arises due to personal existence view. You won't experience those situations anymore. If you trip and fall or you drop something or you misspeak in front of somebody, uh, you won't feel that. Or if you're public speaking and you're shy, this is because of personal existence view. When you eradicate personal existence view, you'll have full confidence to go into a room to public speak and you'll have no issues with that whatsoever. So you implement things like what I'm describing, like changing your language in order to help you wear away that personal existence view. And then slowly but surely, you'll see that these things will be more peaceful and joyful for you in daily life. And then you might just choose to go back to the way you were speaking. But the mind deeply understands that these things aren't you, that the body has pain or the head hurts or the body needs water or the body needs food or things like this. What you would like to do along with this is you would like to deeply develop the understanding of impermanence. The universal truth of impermanence is the very first thing that I teach students when they first become a new student. They need to deeply understand the universal truth of impermanence. Without understanding the universal truth of impermanence, you wouldn't be able to make any other progress on the path to enlightenment. Because the whole problem of why the mind is experiencing discontentedness is because the mind is craving for permanence. It wants things to be permanent. And if you get the objects of your affection, you get pleasant feelings. If you don't get the objects of your affection, you experience painful feelings. So as long as that relationship is intact, you might feel a certain amount of happiness or excitement. But when the relationship is over, now the mind experiencing that impermanence, it doesn't like it and it experiences painful feelings. Or if mom, dad, grandma, grandpa are alive, you feel like there's a certain amount of permanence and the mind feels a certain amount of happiness or excitement in that situation. But then when they die, now you experience that impermanence and the mind gets shaken up and it has this grief or this misery that comes in. But the same reason why people have grief at a funeral is the same reason why they have grief when there's a wedding, when our children or your brother or sister or deep friend goes away and gets married, you might grieve because you feel like this person is leaving because the mind is craving permanence. It's holding on. And now there's these sad feelings that come into play. And this is because there's a misunderstanding in the mind. It doesn't have the wisdom of this universal truth of impermanence and has had it deeply soak in. And this is the same problem that it's experiencing with personal existence view. The same underlying problem that's plaguing the mind and leading to discontentedness where it's craving permanence, it's the same thing as associated with the physical body and the mind. It's craving for this physical body to be permanent. And when it's changing due to impermanence, it doesn't like that. Or there's a certain self-identity. I am a police officer. And now when that changes due to being injured or getting older or retiring or the police force is laying people off or what have you, now you feel diminished and less of a person because the mind doesn't like that impermanence. So you need to deeply soak into the mind this universal truth of impermanence in all aspects of the world around you. Look at the trees, see the green leaves, and then see the brown leaves on the ground, or that there's no leaves at all in the tree. And now you can see there's impermanence, but these leaves are going to come back at some point. That's impermanent too. Or the sun is out and it's shining and it's warm. Now it's cold and it's snowing. That's impermanence. Or the wind's blowing and now it stops blowing. Or you're in a relationship now and now it's over. Or certain clothes that you wear. Now they start to degrade and you either give them away or you throw them away or what have you. You can see this in permanence everywhere. Even you're walking down the street and you see a crack in the sidewalk. Remind yourself, 
ah, impermanence. Or you say something and somebody agrees with you, but then somebody else disagrees with you. That's impermanence, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's impermanence. So deeply observe impermanence around the world that in all these situations that you're in, all these things are impermanent in this physical body and this mind is impermanent. They are eventually going to be done and over with. We all need to die. Every single one of us are going to die. We can't avoid that. So this physical body is going to fade away. This mind is going to fade away. They're impermanent. Next, look at wearing simple clothing. That if your mind is, um, if your mind is used to wearing certain clothing, and this is what you do on a regular basis, that you have a certain way that you look in the world and you select certain clothes before you go out, this is the mind having personal existence view. You might think about, okay, where am I going today? Who am I going to see? Okay, based on where I'm going and who I'm going to see, I would like to wear this. And this now the mind wants to wear this and you put that on. And maybe you're okay with that and you go out. Or maybe you change two or three or four times before you get something that the mind is satisfied with and now you go out into the world. This is because of personal existence view. The mind is trying to sort out how do I want to appear in the environments that I'm going to. So what you would like to do is train the mind that it can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. It can have this peacefulness and this joy no matter what you're wearing because this body isn't you. This physical body isn't who you are as a person. This is why the Buddha wore rag robes, that he just wore simple robes and walked around in those robes because he wasn't associating with needing to be perceived in a certain way. In fact, there was a period of time where a certain student offered him this very expensive, elaborate fabric, and they were interested in him making a robe out of this. And he gave it to one of his students, and he said, go rip this up into shreds, and then sew it back together, and then you guys can wear it as a robe. He wouldn't even wear that very elaborate fabric. So what you can do is something like that, if you like, but not many people do that nowadays. Usually ordained practitioners wear robes, or you might decide to wear simple clothes, like all white, like you see that I wear the same exact clothes every day. I just pick out the same clothes and I put them on every single day. Uh, I just wear the same exact clothes, and this is the way to train the mind. But if you're not interested in doing that and you would like some variety in your clothing or in you may not be interested in going out to buy a lot of the same exact clothing, what you can do is with your existing wardrobe, you can actually just stack it up with your shirts and pants or your skirts or whatever, or you can just line it up in a closet and you can just pick the first one. Whatever the first one is, just pick that off the top and wear that. What you're probably going to observe as you're starting to do this is you're going to try to uh, pick one off the top and that's what you're training your mind to do. But you might try to go down into the third or fourth or fifth shirt and grab that one. That's the personal existence view, trying to jump in there and make a choice about what you're going to wear today based on where you're going. And what you would like to do is cut that off and train the mind to just wear whatever is on top the simple, or if you have it lined up in a closet, just grab the first thing. Now, of course, if you're going for a job interview or you're going to a lawyer's office or somewhere that you, those people are expecting you to look a certain way, then of course you need to, you know, kind of wear, wear certain clothing for a job interview. You're not going to show up with the holy shorts uh, or the holy jeans that are on the top of the pile. You're not going to wear those to your job interview because those people have certain expectations. Maybe you're training your mind to eliminate personal existence view and you know what you're doing in this situation, but those people don't necessarily know what you're doing and they're not necessarily going to appreciate it. So in this situation, for a few hours, okay, wear your clothes, whatever you think is appropriate, and go do your job interview because now you would like to ensure that you're looking a certain way because those people might have certain expectations or certain judgments. But then when that's over and you're just at the house, you would like to just pick whatever is on top. Or if you're going out to 
uh, have dinner with friends or you're going to the movies or you're going out in the yard to do something or anything else that you're doing that isn't like a job interview or something like this that's going to have long-term effect just grab right off the top or pick the first thing in the closet or if you've purchased just the same clothes and you're wearing the simple clothes over and over repeatedly just wear those simple clothes and train the mind that this body isn't who you are you don't need to look a certain way and you don't need to be perceived a certain way in the world and now the mind can experience this peacefulness and this joy associated with just looking whatever comes up on the top of the pile of these clothes. And along with that, if you find right now that you're wearing certain jewelry or body decorations or makeup or certain body scents or perfumes or colognes or things like this, this is typically because the mind is trying to be perceived a certain way. Uh, the mind wants to look a certain way. And what you will need to do is go through a period of time, whether that's six months or a year or what have you, where you're not using these things, where you're not so uh, worried about having certain earrings or certain chain or certain uh, hairstyle or certain things like this, uh, certain makeup, that you purge that out of your practice and you don't put these things on for a period of time. Now may be the right time for you to do that or it may be at some point in the future. This is where your personal choice comes in, that I'm not telling you how to do this or when to do it, but if you would like to eliminate personal existence view, you would ultimately like to get to a period of time where maybe for six months or a year or longer that you're not wearing jewelry, even a simple watch, uh, any kind of earrings, you're completely comfortable with no makeup. Uh, yeah, you maybe do your hair to kind of look presentable when you go out into the world, but you're not overly obsessive about your hair. Uh, you can just go out into the world and be completely content. Some people might even shave their hair and remove their facial hair uh, in order to train the body. Uh, I'm sorry, in order to train the mind that the body doesn't need to look any particular way. And this is why we cut off our hair as part of this uh, practice. And not everybody needs to cut off their hair, but that is something that you can do if you would like to train to get to the point where you're not interested in projecting a certain personal existence view. I'm gonna share with you multiple things here and you get to choose what it is that you would like to do. It's your personal journey. There's no requirement, there's no judgment, there's nothing like that, but this is guidance to help you understand things that you can do in order to eradicate personal existence view. Oftentimes for a woman, cutting off the hair is a much more challenging thing uh, if there's a lot of association with the hair. For some men, that can be challenging as well. Uh, for people who have facial hair, sometimes that can be a challenge. There can be a craving to the facial hair, but there can also be a craving to a certain relationship. Maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife really likes that facial hair. And you feel like if you don't have the facial hair, that your boyfriend or girlfriend or your husband or wife isn't going to like you as much. And what you're doing is training your mind that you can be peaceful and joyful without this facial hair or without this head hair, for example. And then your partner may need to go through a bit of training as well to realize that they love you just as much, whether you have the facial hair or head hair or whether you don't. And this can actually be good for their mind too. But it may be something that you might be holding on to for your own reasons of personal existence view. But there might also be certain cravings and relationships where you're reluctant to let some of these things go, like your clothing or certain jewelry or certain uh, head and facial hair because of what they mean to other people. So you're gonna need to ascend above that where you can see that just because you don't wear a wedding ring, for example, doesn't mean you're any less committed. Sometimes in relationships, if one of our partners take off the wedding ring, we feel like, oh my goodness, they must be angry at me, or they must want to get a divorce because they're not wearing their wedding ring anymore. Well, you can have a talk with your partner and let them know what you're planning to do and that you love them just as much whether you're wearing the wedding ring or not. 
right? And you can show them that through your intentions, your speech, and your actions, and just let them know that this is something that you're planning to do in order to train to eliminate personal existence view. Because one of the things that the mind can do is it can get attached to this jewelry and these different things. If you ever watch certain people when they talk, uh, if they get uncomfortable in a certain situation, they will touch their wedding ring. If they feel uncomfortable for any reason, you can see this with celebrities, newscasters, politicians, people who are on TV, or even just your boss if you're in a business meeting or other coworkers. When people are talking and the mind gets uncomfortable, they will tend to touch something where they feel comfortable. And if they're married, they might have a wedding ring and they'll touch that wedding ring. And that's the mind thinking that if they touch that, they'll associate that with comfort. But what you would like to do is train the mind that you don't need that wedding ring. And you can be just as peaceful and just as joyful so you might need to go, you know, one or two days wearing it, three, four, five days not wearing it, one day wearing it, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten days not wearing it, and kind of train the mind through this impermanence that you can bring these, these, in, these things in, you can bring them out, and the mind can be just as peaceful, just as joyful, whether you have these things or not. And then if you can go an extended period of time, for six months, a year or longer, where you're wearing simple clothes, you're not wearing jewelry or otherwise decorating the body in any particular way with makeup or colognes or perfumes and stuff. And if you decide you would like to eliminate facial hair or head hair, these can all be helpful to move in the direction of eliminating personal existence view. Then some other things that you might decide to look at is eliminating your interest to project this certain self-image through cutting off and letting go anytime discontentedness arises related to the self-image or the self-identity. So you need to get to the point where you no longer have a desire or a craving for this to be actually projected in the world so that where you observe discontentedness arising related to personal existence view that you cut it off and let it go this is where the eightfold path and the training on the eightfold path comes into play because this is part of right effort right mindfulness what right mindfulness is is having awareness of the mind and more specifically those four foundations of mindfulness of the bodily sensations the feelings the condition of the mind and the mental objects so before the mind becomes discontent with feelings there's going to be some bodily sensation that's occurring with anger you might feel sharp pains or you might feel heat rising up in the body you might feel heat or pressure in the skull if you're shy, you might say you have butterflies in your stomach, which is essentially the uh, stomach just feeling queasy. If you're angry or sad uh, or frustrated, you might feel heart palpitations in some situations. These are the bodily sensations, and there's others that are unique to you, that if you start looking at them more and more closely, you'll see that before the mind experiences things like anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, all of these, including things like happiness, excitement, elation, there's gonna be some bodily sensation that's arising. And you would like to get so aware of that that you can cut it off and let it go as a bodily sensation. But if you miss it there, it's then gonna become a feeling in the mind. And if you can observe it there, that it is a feeling now that the anger has entered or the excitement and elation has entered or the boredom or loneliness or shyness has entered. And if you can cut it off as a feeling, OK, now it won't affect the condition of your mind, because once it starts entering in as a feeling, now the condition of the mind can be affected for many hours or many days. Have you ever been mad or angry for like a week or two? I'm sure you've experienced that, right? That's because of the condition of mind, that you didn't cut off this anger as a bodily sensation. <clears throat> you didn't observe it and cut it off as a feeling in the mind. So now it affected the condition of the mind more long term for several hours, days, or weeks even. And then there's these mental objects that get formed, like ill will, like this deeply rooted container of ill will or central desire or complacency or things like this get deeply rooted in the mind and how it affects the mind 
for a really long period of time. So what you would like to do is build up your mindfulness with so much awareness that you're aware of these bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind and these mental objects that you can now get ahead of the curve and that you can cut off and let go of any discontentedness as a bodily sensation. And this saves you all the trouble of having the mind polluted with these feelings of discontentedness and now having it affect the condition of the mind and feeding this mental object. The way to understand this is that if you were going to take a boat from North America to Europe and you're in the middle of the ocean, you would like to prevent this water from ever coming into the boat. Because once the water gets into the boat, you've got a real problem on your hands. You've got to get rid of this water and you've got to patch up the boat. But if you can prepare the boat so well that it prevents the water from ever coming into the boat, now you've just saved yourself a whole lot of difficulties. So if you can be aware of these bodily sensations that are occurring when somebody says something agreeable and there's these pleasant feelings starting to arise, or they say something disagreeable about the self-image or self-identity and there's these painful feelings arising, if you can see that as a bodily sensation and you can cut it off and let it go there, now you can just go forward in your day and be peaceful and joyful rather than allowing the anger to come into the mind, for example. This person, whoever is saying things or however you're experiencing things in the world, this is your mind is not controlled. You're not able to have discipline of the mind because you haven't trained it yet. So if you can be meditating with breathing mindfulness meditation regularly, two or three times a day for 30 minutes or more, you're going to develop this mindfulness or awareness of mind where you can be aware of these bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind and these mental objects. And more and more, you can cut off and let go of discontentedness as just a bodily sensation because you can see it at that point and you have such control over the mind that you can cut it off and let it go. But if it does become a feeling, okay, now the mind's angered. Now let's function skillfully. Let's make some wise decisions to cut it off and let it go there so it doesn't affect the condition of the mind more long-term. But if you miss it there, still cut it off as the condition of the mind. Here you can redirect the mind Rather than allowing those feelings to persist in the mind, you might need to get up and go for a bike ride or go for a walk, or maybe you need to do something else, some gardening or something else like this. This can be a way to redirect the mind and not allow it to dwell in those feelings or allow it to dwell with that condition of mind being affected. And then more and more, you just aspire and you aim and you train to be aware of the bodily sensations sooner and sooner and cut it off and let it go there. So developing this mindfulness is being aware of these four foundations of mindfulness, of the bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind, and the mental objects. Right effort is taking the effort that when you observe these unwholesome qualities arising, that you cut it off and you let it go. Because you're not gonna be able to just, you know, trip into enlightenment. You're gonna be needing to be conscious and gain the wisdom of how to consciously make decisions that are wise, that where you observe these bodily sensations, feelings, condition of mind, or the mental objects, that you know how to address it. So while you're cutting off and letting go, of the bodily sensations as a bodily sensation, and you're getting better and better at that, this mental object of personal existence view, this fetter, this taint, this pollution, you're working to break that up and get it out of the mind so that you'll no longer experience the arising of discontentedness related to personal existence view. But as long as you allow this process to continue, where you experience something, you have the bodily sensations, it becomes a feeling in the mind, now it affects the condition of the mind, and it's more firmly developing this mental object of personal existence view, now it's going to get deeper and deeper rooted. So by you putting kind of a blockade on this and cutting it off and letting it go as a bodily sensation, or as a feeling, more and more you would like to cut it off as a bodily sensation so that it never penetrates into the mind. 
all the while you're working with the meditation to realize non-self and some of these other things that I'm sharing to break up this mental object so personal existence view can be completely dissolved and eradicated, destroyed, eliminated, and obliterated out of the mind. And this is how you get a handle on this, applying right effort as you have right mindfulness, that you're aware of this whole process and that you can then skillfully work with it to eliminate personal existence view from the mind. So wherever you observe discontentedness arising associated with the self that is not truly there, but the mind falsely believes it is, it has this pollution of personal existence view, then you cut it off, you let it go, and you get more and more skillful with this, all the while breaking up this mental object of personal existence view. And as you're doing this throughout your days and your weeks and your months, you might need to seek guidance with a teacher in order to consult and get assistance. This is where you can post in the Facebook group, you can Excuse me, you can ask questions in these online classes. Wednesday is a great time to ask all these kind of uh, miscellaneous questions where typically on Sundays we're covering a certain topic. So that's where we need to stick with those particular questions. But on Wednesdays and other days, you can be asking questions in classes. You can send a personal message if you like, or you can schedule a personal guidance session by going to the website, buddhadailywisdom.com, and you can schedule a session where I sh put times in there that are open for me, and then when you open it, wherever you are, it's gonna show in your local time zone what times are available, and then when you schedule an appointment, it'll come to me, and then I can help you with personal existence view or any other things that it is that you're challenged with, because this is a particular topic that students typically need to listen in a class, learn in class, ask questions. They need to read it in a book. They need to consult with the teacher. They need to ask more questions. They need to put it into practice, work with it for a while, read some more, talk with the teacher. There's this repetitive process of gaining more and more wisdom and getting better and better with understanding personal existence view and implementing these things so that you're gradually wearing it away. You're not gonna be able to sit in just one class like this learn what I'm sharing, and then immediately eliminate personal existence view. It's this gradual wearing away over a consistent period of time that you're focusing in on this and then implementing these things. And you're going to need to probably go with this repetitive process of reading, asking questions, attending classes, asking questions, uh, consulting with a teacher, asking questions, putting this into practice all the way through that and asking more questions. And then you get more and more wisdom around what this is and how do we eradicate it through the things that I'm sharing with you here. So I'll open up to any questions that you guys have for the rest of today's class. We can talk about personal existence view, the universal truth of non-self, any of these aspects that I just described of how to actually eliminate it. So you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow up questions directly. Thank you, sir. Bossom has his hand raised. Well, uh, I'm interested to ask about something, uh, perhaps it's related to the personal existence view. So uh, here in the Middle East, there is some kind of culture which is really common. So people tend to de degrade themselves. So I would say that uh, if you're talking to someone from Sudan and uh, asking him perhaps about people from Libya, he would say, oh, people from Libya are very kind and polite, but people here in Sudan are very uh, impolite. They are not very kind. If you went to someone from Libya asking him <laughs> about the other countries, he would say the same. Oh, all the other countries are very kind, respectful, and polite. But here, people are really impolite. And so the same, if you would talk to... I would say all my experience of asking people this certain uh, question, typically they reply with this uh, uh, way of grading themselves. So is this related to the personal existence view? 
This is more related to conceit, which is the eighth fetter, where there there's this measuring and comparing, there's this judging of others, where we're either putting ourselves above or below others. And this is degrading to the mind because the mind is judging. It's looking at someone and it's judging them as either polite or impolite. And then you're putting yourself either above or below that and the mind is discontent in that situation. And it's also uh, unwise to speak that way too, having wrong speech, because if somebody in Libya is around and you're talking that way, then they're going to, because of that person's personal existence view, they're going to hear somebody talking and judging somebody in Libya or Sudan or what have you. And now because of their personal existence view, they're going to end up becoming discontent. So it's actually the conceit that is causing somebody to do that. But then by eradicating that and using right speech, you won't run into conflicts and problems where people having personal existence view will now have conflicts with you. So I've talked about this with a few students personally, but let me share this now in class. One of the things that the Buddhist teachings are doing for you, in addition to everything else, as you're learning this path, is he's teaching you how to, of course, train your mind, understanding these natural laws of existence, and train to the point where you can experience peace and calm, serenity, contentedness, and joy. One of the reasons why that is occurring, in addition to the training of the mind, is you're not causing any harm through things like your intentions, your speech, and your actions. So by you eliminating these fetters, by you practicing something like right speech, you wouldn't disparage anybody else. You wouldn't talk in diminishing ways about somebody from your own country. Because if you understand the unenlightened mind, that all the unenlightened minds have this personal existence view, if they're not on this path and they're not in the first stage of enlightenment, they're going to have personal existence view. So if we talk with wrong speech and disparage another country, for example, because of that person's personal existence view, you are now speaking in a way that's triggering that craving. They're getting discontent. They don't realize that they're actually getting discontent because of their personal existence view and their craving they're going to have wrong view and attribute their painful feelings to you. But if you would have just spoke with right speech and not said that to begin with, you would be able to exist in this relationship peacefully. So yes, you need to do all this work to eradicate the pollution of mind and practice this hateful path so that you're practicing good moral conduct. But part of what that's doing for you is to help you be around people who are unenlightened who do have personal existence view and they're going to get discontent when you disparage another country or you disparage the country that they're from and now they're going to falsely attribute that to you. Whereas if you didn't understand personal existence view and you didn't understand wrong speech, for example, and you went to a stadium, I'll use your FIFA World Cup example, Bossom, if you went to a stadium and you start disparaging Brazil and you're from Chile, for example, and now you start disparaging people from Brazil, Brazil, now you're going to get attacked and beat up. And, you know, not that you deserve that, but that was the result of your decisions of using wrong speech. Now other people's personal existence view flared up and now they're practicing wrong action. And now you found yourself getting beat up or maybe even killed because of your lack of wisdom around these natural laws of existence and the Eightfold Path. So, I answered your question already, Basum, but I just would like to go further with it so that you can see that the Buddha is guiding you of how to live harmoniously with other people, that if you understand right speech and you practice right speech, you'll be good to go in all situations. But in situations where you're not practicing right speech and you might dis be disparaging somebody related to personal existence view, that's going to flare up anger in their mind. And now you've got a big problem to deal with because of your choice to practice wrong speech. Yes, that helps. Thanks, teacher. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Let's go to Tonka. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, Middle Bay needs some uh, uh, clarification on bodily sensation. He says, could you give more examples how to identify bodily sensation 
the challenge for the beginner is that of not noticing bodily sensation. The effect, the mind goes deeper and deeper into discontentedness and it continues. What do you suggest when, you, when that happens? So what I suggest for people when they're first starting out is to get familiar with the AFO path at a very general level. And with right mindfulness, the way that I teach it for a beginner is just awareness of mind, just having awareness of the mind. Because if you're gonna purify the mind on the path to enlightenment and eradicate these pollutions, you need to start with just awareness, just general awareness of the mind. As you're putting together all the parts of the Eightfold Path, and typically the Buddha would teach people to focus on the moral conduct section first, because as long as you're putting harm out into the world through your moral conduct, harm's gonna keep coming back to you. So you need to clean that up first with your right speech, your right action, and your right livelihood. Cleaning that up first, and it really starts with right view and right intention, which is part of the wisdom section. So working with the moral conduct and getting that all cleaned up, then while you're cleaning that up, you're just thinking of right mindfulness as awareness of mind. And once you get all your moral conduct cleaned up, now you start looking at deepening your understanding of right mindfulness, which is truly those four foundations of mindfulness. And by this time, you would have been meditating with breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation for an extended period of time. So you should start noticing more mindfulness in the mind. And you should start noticing that there is these bodily sensations that are occurring prior to the mind becoming discontent. Right now, you might not be able to see that because you're not delineating it because you maybe haven't trained enough in breathing mindfulness meditation to slow the mind down to be able to observe it. This is why people have road rage, for example. They go from zero to a thousand miles an hour in their mind and getting out a baseball bat and a gun with road rage because they blew through the bodily sensations, they blew through the feelings, the mind is just you know, working with this ill will, this mental object of ill will, this rage is coming out. That person can't even observe the bodily sensations because their mind is so undisciplined. It's just blowing right past all of that stuff. So if you're putting together the other steps of the Eightfold Path, which includes breathing mindfulness meditation, the mind will start slowing down a bit. And then in certain situations, you can observe, oh yeah, there's that bodily sensation before the mind became frustrated or before the mind even becomes happy, excited, elated, there's certain bodily sensation that's occurring. So generally when you first start, just look at mindfulness as awareness of mind. Start trying to gain awareness of just what's in the mind, what thoughts, what uh, things are coming through the mind, what feelings are there. And then as you're training with these teachings, you'll start becoming more aware of the bodily sensations. And then that's where you would like to cut it off and let it go. But even in that beginning phase where you don't see the bodily sensations, but maybe you do see the feelings, for example, or you do see the condition of the mind, you can still get used to cutting it off and letting it go there. And redirecting the mind can sometimes be a way to do that. We used to do this even with my son when he was an infant. You can do this with little babies and toddlers that when you start seeing them cry or sometimes their face will have these really funny looks before the crying comes out. When you see them starting to become discontent, like redirect their mind because an infant that's three months old or you know, uh, a year old or something like this, or a toddler, they can't understand the four foundations of mindfulness and applying right effort. But if the parent understands it, when they see the child getting ready to get upset, you can be, oh, was that a bird outside? What was that? Did you see that cloud? That is such a beautiful cloud. Look at that. And then you pick them up and take them over. They might not even be able to talk yet. Um, and you're kind of redirecting their mind this way. So you can do this with your own mind that when you see the feelings and the condition of mind that is happening, maybe you don't have awareness of the bodily sensations yet, but you can still redirect the mind because you observe the feelings and condition of mind. And this will help you to learn and train the mind to cut it off and let it go. And then with this more proficiency of training to cut off and let go in meditation, that when the mind moves off the breath, you cut that off and let it go and bring it back to the breath. 
Now you get more and more awareness of those bodily sensations and all that preliminary work that you were doing in meditation and in daily life where you're redirecting the mind based on feelings and condition of the mind. Now that discipline of the mind becomes beneficial. As you start becoming aware of these bodily sensations, you're going to be more readily able to cut it off and let it go there because you did all this preliminary work. Thank you, teacher David. Also, I would like to ask about the difference between enlightened mind and unenlightened mind. As we talk, like body is impermanent, mind is impermanent. But what about uh, enlightened mind? I understand there is no changes in enlightened mind. It's steady. And uh, also, I was wondering, um, at the time of death, is there a chance that enlightened mind uh, is immortal and uh, doesn't uh, dissipate? Okay, so in the unenlightened mind, the body itself and the mind itself is impermanent, right? It's meaning that the body is not permanent, it's not going to last forever, it arises, it changes, and it fades away. In the mind itself, it's also impermanent. It arises, changes, and fades away. It's going to no longer exist at some point. And the feelings in the mind of the unenlightened being, they're impermanent. They arise, they change, and they fade away. This is what's experienced in the unenlightened mind. You're very familiar with this because this is what you're experiencing. In the enlightened mind, the body is still impermanent. It's not going to be permanent. The mind itself is impermanent. It's not going to last permanently. There is no you know, immortal or eternal uh, mind that's going to last forever. It's still impermanent. But the qualities that the person experiences in the enlightened mental state, the peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, this is permanent in that it's unconditioned. So a conditioned object is going to arise, change, and fade away. But an unconditioned object, it's not going to arise, it's not going to change, and it's not going to fade away. So the feelings in the unenlightened mind, they're conditioned on some impermanent condition. And they're based on craving anger and ignorance. There's those conditions in there that are arising these discontent feelings. But when you purify the mind and the mind is now enlightened, the mind is now unconditioned. It's in this natural state that in the unenlightened mind, there's this mind that is enlightened, but it's hindered by all this pollution. But when we get all that pollution out of the way, now that brightness and that radiance of the enlightened mind can shine through. This is why you get glimpses of what, of what enlightenment is like as you're getting closer and closer to enlightenment because the enlightened mind is starting to shine through. But because there is still some degree of pollution, then the mind is going to ultimately experience discontentedness. But when the mind is enlightened and you fully eradicated all the pollutions and the mind is now purified, this enlightened qualities are now shining and you're experiencing the natural state of the mind permanently for the rest of this life. And what once this person dies, we know that the body is impermanent. We know that the mind is impermanent. But what happens next is an undeclared teaching. The Buddha never declared what would happen next once a person attains enlightenment and dies. So by that point, though, the enlightened being is experiencing such peacefulness, such joy in the mind. You're not going to care what's next if there's anything next at all. Oftentimes in the unenlightened state, we really worry about what's going to happen to us when we die. There's even fear of death in the unenlightened state. But by the time you're enlightened and the mind is enlightened, there's no fear of death. The mind is eliminated all craving, desire, attachment. The mind's fully purified. It's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy that you don't have a care in the world about what may or may not happen next. You're no longer fearing death. If there is something next, okay, there's something next. If there's not something next, okay, that's fine too. Uh, but if there is something next, it's either going to be as good as what you're experiencing in the enlightened state or better. And if there isn't anything next, which the Buddha left this undeclared, he didn't declare whether there is or isn't something, then if there isn't something next, then okay, you know, so be it. You got to enjoy the rest of this life in the enlightened mental state. 
experiencing that peacefulness and joy. And the Buddha describes this enlightened mental state beyond pleasure and pain. And I can agree with that description that the enlightened mental state is beyond pleasure and pain. You're no longer experiencing the up of pleasure and the down of pain, that the mind is now beyond that and no longer experiencing the up and down, but it's just always peaceful and always joyful. Thank you, teacher David. I'm also wondering, uh, like, uh, the goal is not to be uh, born again, to exit the cycle of rebirth, right? And, uh, like, if we don't know what happens, like, how do we even know that that's our goal? I would say that the goal is to eliminate the pollutions of mind in order to eliminate discontentedness and get to enlightenment. And as a result of that, you are escaping the cycle of rebirth. Okay, teacher David, thank you very much. Yeah, this whole cycle of rebirth thing, it's something that is there. It's absolutely 100% the truth. Um, as somebody attains enlightenment, they will no longer experience rebirth. And you can use that as motivation that you're not interested in coming back and experiencing the certain miseries and grief and pain and sadness and frustration. Sure, we've had certain pleasures that we've experienced in our human existence, but those pale in the comparison to what you experience in the enlightened mental state. Letting go of this temporary happiness and excitement that's ultimately displeasing and unsatisfactory pales in the comparison to what you experience in this joy in the enlightened mental state. So no matter what pleasures or excitements you've ever experienced in the unenlightened state, that's minimal compared to what you'll experience when you learn to let go of that and experience this permanent joy. And now, as a result of that, if you're escaping the cycle of rebirth, having attained enlightenment, you are escaping the cycle of rebirth. Now, whatever happens next, it happens next, right? You're not training the mind in order to get something next because that would be a craving, right? That would be, I'm only going to train my mind if I get this better thing later. Now, what is that better thing that I'm going to get? Tell me now so that I'll be able to do this. So now what happens is that craving to get to that better thing supersedes all your other cravings, and but now they're still craving in the mind. So the Buddha wisely decided not to declare what comes next, because you need to get to the point where the mind lets go and isn't even interested in knowing what's next or if there is something next, because otherwise they're just gonna be a craving for that thing and now you're not going to be able to experience enlightenment because they're still craving. So by the time you eradicate the sixth and seventh fetter, which we're going to talk about next week, you eliminate desire for rebirth in either the form or formless realm. And now, as an enlightened being, you can reside in the present moment, peaceful and joyful, because you're not longing and yearning for what's next and what's to come. Whereas if you're continuing to long and yearn for what's next, you can't reside peaceful and joyful in the present moment. Also, teacher David Pepeco made a comment to transcend the Kama world, question mark, if you want to comment on that. To transcend what? World. The gamma world. Well, as long as you're as long as you're in existence, there's going to be gamma. You can extinguish the unwholesome gamma, right? So what gamma is is cause and effect or action and result, the results of your decisions. That's all that gamma is. Oftentimes people think of gamma as this mystical magical thing, as these punishment and rewards, as this dark cloud that's following you around. That's actually not what gamma is. And I'm not saying that you think that way, but that's sometimes the way that people think about the gamma or the natural law of gamma. But in reality, it's not this punishment and rewards. It's not this mystical, magical thing. It's not this dark cloud. All it is is the results of your decisions, the cause and effect. And the more that you train in the Buddhist teachings, you can see this cause and effect very clearly. And because the mind in the unenlightened state is unwise 
of this natural law, it lacks wisdom, it's going to continue to do unwise things. It's going to make unwise decisions. It's going to put out harm in the world, and therefore harm is going to come back to you. So for example, if you're polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, this is very wise, and you're going to have lots of friends as a result of that. Whereas if you're impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, you put that out into the world, and that's what's going to come back to you. You're going to have a lot of difficulties in your relationships. You're going to have a lot of difficulties at work with your coworkers. You're going to have trouble holding down certain jobs and being uh, successful in your work. This isn't anybody controlling the natural law of gamma. This isn't punishment and rewards. This is just the results of your decisions. So when we have the wisdom of this natural law and you get deeper and deeper to understand it, now you'll naturally make wise decisions about this. And what you're doing is part of this path to enlightenment to get to enlightenment is you're extinguishing all your unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. So you're extinguishing the unwholesome gamma but along the way you're making wiser and wiser and wiser decisions to the point where you're only producing wholesome results because you're making wiser and wiser decisions so even when you're enlightened you're still ha experiencing gamma of the results of your decisions but by that time you're only making wise decisions so you're only experiencing wholesome results nothing is going to come back to you that's harmful. The way that I describe this process is that if you had a garden hose and what you've been doing all throughout life because of the lack of wisdom, you've been putting mud into this garden hose. And when you are trying to get something out of this garden hose, it's just mud that's coming back because we've made unwise decisions and we put all this mud into the garden hose. Well, now when you start learning the Buddhist teachings, it's like hooking that garden hose up to a faucet and you turn on the water. And depending on how you start, you might just turn it on a little bit. You might not be reading much. You might not be attending classes much. You might not be meditating very much. You might just have a little bit of trickle coming out of that a faucet of putting clean water into this garden hose. So you're just getting a little trickle out the other end and there's a lot of mud mixed into it. So because of your unwise decisions in the past, there's mud coming out of this garden hose. But the more you turn on this faucet, you get more dedicated, you attend classes regularly, you read books, you meditate, you really work skillfully, you do this inner work. It's like turning on this water and you got this pure water coming through this garden hose more and more. But even when you first turn on this garden hose, it's going to spit mud for a while because we've been putting mud into this garden hose. But slowly but surely, as more and more wise decisions go into your life and you put more and more clean water into this garden hose, it's going to spit mud but it's gonna spit some clean water every once in a while. You're gonna see, oh wow, look at these wholesome results. But then it's gonna spit more mud because of the decisions that you made in the past. So as you're putting more and more water into this garden hose, eventually you get to the point where you've completely flushed out all this mud and you've got nothing but clear water coming out of the end. You might even be able to take a sip of the water and it's like, oh wow, so refreshing. Thank goodness I did all this work. That's what enlightenment is, is that you're flushing out this garden hose, getting rid of all this pollution. You're getting rid of all this mud in the mind that's been accumulating over this life and previous lives as well. And by the time the mind actually gets to enlightenment, you can see the truth for yourself that there's clear water coming out of this garden hose. There's no more mud in this garden hose. And the way that you experience that is you see the discontentedness gradually diminishing you see less and less mud coming out of the garden hose. And eventually you get to the point where it's been a year or two or three and you don't see any discontentedness. There's no sadness, there's no irritation, there's no anger. There isn't even the slightest dislike in the enlightened mind, even that slightest little uncomfortableness. It's just not there, but there's still gamma. And the gamma at this point is all wholesome because you've only been putting fresh water into this garden hose. You've only been putting wise decisions into your life. So now there's only wholesomeness that's coming back to you. Uh, Pepe is following, isn't gamma one of the five nayamas? 
This is sorry not, for pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, this is not part of the teachings of the Buddha. This gamma, it's a natural law that all the teachings of the Buddha come back to. You won't find what you're describing in the original source teachings of the Buddha. This is one of the challenges in the world where we don't have a massive number of enlightened beings yet. That's what's being worked on. And But each individual needs to do the work. The challenge of why we don't have a massive number of enlightened beings in the world is because over 2,500 years of history, there's been all this impermanence and people have been changing and modifying the teachings of the Buddha. And when you're reading and you're learning and all these different authors and all these different classes and people aren't using the words of the Buddha, they're teaching all these modifications and all these changes. But when you look at the original source teachings of the Buddha using the words of the Buddha, then you can see what he taught and what he didn't teach. And then you can see guidance with the teacher and you can independently verify each one of his teachings and see the truth for yourself as you independently verify his teachings and then you start practicing them, you can see the condition of the mind gradually improving. But with so much impermanence in the world, a lot of people have studied different things and it sounds like you have where you've been studying things that aren't the words of the Buddha. So if you go to the website buddhadailywisdom.com, you can click on the link for free books and if you're watching this on YouTube or something, the link should be right there in the description. You can click on that and you can see all the books, the 13 book book series that I share for free, which is the words of the Buddha. It's all based on the words of the Buddha and you can independently verify each one of his teachings and then you can practice them and see the condition of the mind improving so that you'll know the truth. In volume one, chapter nine, that's where I introduce you to the natural law of gamma. And then in volume six of the book series, that entire book series, that entire book is devoted to the natural law of gamma. And you can read and understand what the natural law of gamma is. But truly, every aspect of the Buddhist teachings in one way or another is coming back to the natural law of gamma. In fact, the Eightfold Path is describing the natural law of gamma around all those steps. So something like right speech, for example, the Buddha is explaining to you how to speak in a way that doesn't harm others, so therefore harm doesn't come to you. He doesn't tell you exactly what to say or how to say it, but he gives you this guidance around things that are harmful and then how you choose to implement that through your personality and your word choice and stuff is totally up to you. But without the wisdom of that natural law of gamma around speech, for sure you're speaking in ways that is causing harm and therefore people are going to be harsh and aggressive to you at some points in your life. So the only way for you to clean up what you experience in life and clean up this garden hose and clean up your gamma is to deeply understand the natural law of gamma. And now by you doing something different, you'll experience different results. What people tend to do in the unenlightened mind is they think the goal of this life is to change other people and get everybody else to do something. But this is just the ego in there thinking that, you know, I'm perfect and I need to change everybody else. But in reality, what you learn on this path is all the work that you do on this path is with your own mind. And this is why you can get to enlightenment because all the discontent feelings of sadness, anger, and others, you're actually causing them yourself. But you wouldn't understand that if you don't deeply understand the natural law of gamma and how you need to improve your work in the way that your mind functions. And by you gaining wisdom to improve your practice and train your mind, now you function in the world in a different way. And now the results that you experience are different. See, we tend to think that we go out into the world and we either have good luck or bad luck or that whatever is happening to us we're just subjected to whatever is happening to us. We have no uh, ability to affect what is actually happening to us. But this is a lack of wisdom of the natural law of gamma, that every single thing you experience is a action and result or a cause and effect. And when you understand the causes that lead to certain effects, or if you understand the actions that lead to certain results, now you can make wise decisions about how you choose to function in the world. And now you'll experience different results. 
But remember, you still got mud in the garden hose. So even if you decide to clean up your practice today, and even if you were able to snap your fingers and instantly clean up everything in one day, which you wouldn't be able to do, but even if you did, you would still have to deal with those unwholesome results of the unwise decisions in the past. So you need to do this consistent long-term period of dedication and diligence to train the mind to, yes, understand this natural law of karma, but doing it with the words of the Buddha. If you're not studying the words of the Buddha, you're not going to understand what he taught and what he didn't teach to then be able to independently verify it and practice it. And he talks about this in his teachings, how it's so important to not change his words, change his teachings, and to focus on what it is that he taught so that you can then examine it and investigate it and experience real results. Thank you, teacher David. That's all questions that we have on YouTube at this time. Thank you. Um, teacher David, I have a question. Um, we were talking about um, not, not going on this path for like the end result, just um, of what might happen next, maybe to eliminate discontentedness. I find um, there's an interest to be on this path to become a better person, be a better parent. Um, is that a bad way of looking at this, or is am I is that kind of holding myself back from experiencing enlightenment um, with having that goal in mind? Um, I think that's a wonderful way to think about it, about becoming a better parent, becoming a better human being for the elimination of discontentedness, training the mind to gain wisdom, and doing that as a goal, objective, or interest. Even what Tonka was talking about, about the cycle of rebirth, if your goal, objective, or interest is to eliminate the cycle of rebirth and you're doing that as a goal, objective, or interest, that's fine. Or if you're doing it as a goal, objective, or interest to eliminate discontentedness, that's fine. Or you're doing it as a goal, objective, or interest to be a better parent, a better person, a better human being, that's fine. What I was referring to is if there's uh, an understanding of what does come next and say there's something wonderful and glorious that comes after enlightenment. If the Buddha knew that that exists and he actually shared it, then people's minds would just crave that. And then they would never actually be able to experience enlightenment. So he didn't say if there is or isn't something next. And I don't know whether he knew whether there is or isn't something next, but he didn't declare it. And I think that was very wise of him because there's enough craving, desire, attachments to get rid of in the mind that if he added one more where he told people about this wonderful, glorious thing, I don't know that there is that, but if he did explain that, like, gosh, that would just be one more thing for the unenlightened mind to eliminate. So as a very wise Buddha, uh, he didn't declare it. And um, so if you have that goal, Chrissy, that's completely fine. You know, have it as a goal, objective or interest where you're not indifferent and you're not complacent and just, you know, allowing whatever happens happens and you don't care what happens in your life regarding parenting but also if you crave to be this wonderful perfect parent and you would like to snap your fingers and be that person today then your mind's going to be discontent in that situation too so having it as a goal objective or interest where you realize you're a work in progress and you're going to need to do this inner work and things are going to sometimes feel really miserable but then there's going to be some peacefulness on the other side of that and it's just a matter of getting wisdom and making some wise decisions based on the new wisdom that you're bringing into your life and that you're going to gradually work towards this goal. That's what you would like to do is keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, sir. And then I also have another question. Um, as we were speaking of stacking clothes, um, this is something that I've been practicing for a few months and I've noticed um, there's a tendency to go down a few, mm -hmm. but more for comfort, not appearance. And so would this be um, personal existence for you or would it be like a craving for comfort? 
if you're sure that it's because of comfort, right? Like, because I know your job, like you, you clean houses and, you know, if, if you're wearing a, a, a business suit to go clean houses, this isn't going to work out, right? You need to have, you know, maybe some sweatpants or some shorts or something like this. And if you know with 100% certainty that's what you're doing, then okay, you know, do that out of functionality. But what you might choose to do, depending on your life, is you might have, okay, this is my work in active clothes. And I'm going to have that stack. And then over here, this is kind of like my go to meet parent or go to meet teachers at my kid's school stack. Right. And then you might just pull from either stack, depending on what activity for me. You know, I just wear the same clothes all the time everywhere I go. They're like pajamas. They're always comfortable, this kind of thing. Um, even when I go to my son's school, I wear the same clothes. Um, but in your life, depending on your way your life is, you might need to modify this a bit and have two different sets of clothes, work, active, exercise kind of stuff versus kind of like go do other kind of more important things. And that from there, you should be able to pull off the top and then you'll know that uh, the mind is surely not trying to project any certain personal existence view. That's a great idea, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, it, uh, there isn't a question. It's it's a um, a statement on the Zoom. I'm wondering if you'd like me to read that. Seems very kind. Okay, sure. If you'd like to read it, go ahead. Okay. Um, Rhonda wrote, "I don't have a question, but I wanted to express my appreciation for these teachings. I have been seeking exactly what you are offering through." your books, podcasts, etc., and how wonderful you are coming of Chiang Mai. I was there in 2016 and studied Thai healing. I wished, I wished I would have known you were there. <laughs> uh, I have to scroll down, I'm sorry. I left reluctantly. I'm so drawn to Buddhism, but I am what I consider what I consider a beginner. I will be following you and reaching out for private lessons, and perhaps if I am fortunate, I will be able to attend a retreat. I'm signed up for your January series. Wonderful, Rhonda. Nice to meet you for the first time, even here in Zoom and through your question. So yeah, we're starting in January 8th for seven months, and then we also have another program that's a year and a half outside of that. I have you know, classes, courses, retreats here in Chiang Mai and other parts of the world. I think you might be in the USA based on your name. And there's some retreats coming up in the USA and Massachusetts and Georgia. And then uh, also it's interesting that you're into the Thai healing arts because I was once into that as well. Um, so very nice to meet you and Please that you're here, you'll get a chance to meet some other people too. That's part of our community. Sometimes in Zoom, the students like to come in around 8.30, 8.45, Thai time, and then um, whatever time that is in your time zone. And then you get to meet some other people as well. We have a lot of people from all over the world and very lovely uh, group of people that you'll get a chance to participate and be part of. So very nice that you're here. Thank you, Teacher David. She asked that she's from North Texas. Mm. So, um, okay. Yeah, okay. I know where that is. <laughs> and it appears Tonka has her hand raised. Teacher David, I don't know if we have time for this, but Pepeco has a follow-up question. What if I cannot attain enlightenment in my current life? If you can't attain enlightenment in this life, any work that you've done in this life will benefit you in a future life. So if you did nothing at all in this life, there's absolutely going to uh, potentially be this rebirth. Um, and uh, you don't know necessarily what realm that's going to be in. There's the five realms of hell, animal, afflicted spirits, human, and heavenly realm. And in those lower realms, of hell, animal, and afflicted spirits, they're not permanent realms. You will ultimately get out of those realms, but in those lower realms of hell and animal, it's like being trapped in a prison and there's multiple countless rebirths. And now that you're in this human realm, this is the absolute best time for you to be able to get to enlightenment. 
Uh, and in the heavenly realm, those beings can get to enlightenment as well, but they oftentimes lack motivation and, and, and uh, initiative because they're only experiencing pleasant feelings. So that heavenly realm is not permanent. Those beings still need to do the work to get to enlightenment, and they're less likely because of a lack of motivation. They're oftentimes reborn down into the other realms. So here now in this realm of human is the most ideal time for you to get to enlightenment, and you can do the work and whatever amount of work you do in this life you may get to enlightenment in this life, but if you don't, any work that you've done is going to only benefit you in that you'll have an improved rebirth in your next birth, and you'll retain the wisdom of these teachings in a future life. And this is why some people gravitate to these teachings in this life, and they might find it a bit easier for them in this life uh, to learn these teachings because of work that they've done in previous lives. And then some people find it more challenging in this life because maybe they haven't been exposed to these teachings in previous lives. They didn't make the choice to learn them. And maybe this is even their first birth in the human realm. So they might be dealing with a lot of pollution and everybody's starting at different places. But there's no reason why you can't get to enlightenment in this life, especially if you stay dedicated and diligent. You work with a teacher, you receive guidance and ask for guidance. You use the resources here with the words of the Buddha. That's a game changer for you. No matter what it is that you've been learning in the past, it's a game changer to be learning with the words of the Buddha. Once you start learning with his words and you learn with guidance from a teacher, this is completely revolutionary to your practice. You can be out there on your own trying to dabble through all kinds of stuff. You'll never actually get to enlightenment. But by working with a teacher and a teacher who's dedicating their teachings with the words of the Buddha. It's such a game changer. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get to enlightenment. But if you fall short for any reason, there's always rebirth and you'll benefit from the work that you're doing in this life. Thank you, teacher David. That's all for today on YouTube. That appears to be all the questions for today. All right. Well, I would like to just thank all of you moderators for helping out and thank all of the students for your questions and your comments. Uh, it, yesterday was the first class I taught the entire class with no moderators. And of course, it went just fine, uh, peaceful and joyful. But it really is nice having uh, moderators. You guys, I think, uh, contribute your time and effort to uh, helping out the community and allowing the questions to come in and I can just stay focused on the teaching. That uh, really helps the community to be able to do that. But of course, moderators are impermanent. There's going to be some situations where I teach classes without moderators and that's completely fine. Uh, but I surely appreciate that you guys uh, are contributing to helping out in these classes because I think it benefits everybody. So thank you for your generosity and your commitment to uh, uh, moderating in the class. And thank all of you students for your dedication and diligence to ask questions. And whether you're attending live or you're watching this on the replay, as you continue to learn and you continue to practice, you'll see these benefits as the condition of the mind improves. And getting rid of this personal existence view is a very big step in the right direction. So as you get to the point where you're ready to start focusing in on that, whether it's now or sometime in the future, I'm here to help you in all of those ways that I mentioned. In next Sunday's class, we're going to be focusing in on all the other fetters because there's 10 total. And we I've split this one out because it's one that students tend to need more discussion around and time to understand. So I put this in just one class. But in next week's class, it's titled Eradicating Pollution of the Mind, Eliminating the 10 Fetters. Here we're going to talk about all 10, and I'm going to explain the solutions to all 10. And those will be a lot more straightforward for you in comparison to the personal existence view, because there are things like ill will and central desire, conceit, and things like this, that they'll just be a lot more straightforward for you, where this one, people haven't tended to think about it as much or even have been aware of it so that we need more time to talk about personal existence view. So that's what we'll do next Sunday is 
focus in on eliminating the 10 fetters, describing what the problems are with them, and then the solutions of how to eliminate each individual one. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna be coming together with breathing mindfulness meditation. If you'd like to join that, or you're able to join that either live or on the replay, you're welcome to do that, where we come together to encourage, support, and motivate each other in our meditation practice. And then on Saturday, we do our Pali Canon in English study group, where we're in the very last book of the book series, which is volume 13. And we're focusing in on chapters 41 through chapters 50. So any of you guys that are joining that program, you are welcome to download those books, read chapters 41 through 50 of volume 13, and then attend the class. Or if you'd like to just attend the class, we actually read the chapters in the class, at least the words of the Buddha part, and then I share teachings around it. Uh, but the book will have a lot more information and give you more time to digest it as you go through that program. And then we're going to be restarting that program on January 28th. You can really join that program at any time because it's a year and a half and you can come and go out of that program at any point. But if anybody's interested in starting at the very beginning, it starts on January 28th. So thank you all for joining for today's class. I'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.